Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm Jocelyn. I am very pleased to be hosting David Danzig from Human Rights First. He's going to show us a brief film um, called Primetime Torture, and he's going to talk a little bit about his work. And he's going to leave some time for questions at the end. OK, thank you. Thanks. Uh, OK, hi, I'm David Danzig. I work with a human rights group based in New York City called Human Rights First. And we've been around for about 30 years. and. Actually, we're called the Lawyers Committee for Human Rights up until about four years ago. I've been with Human Rights First for about six years. And the last four years, I've been working on uh, projects and programs related to torture, and specifically the uh, US policy on torture, which um, we haven't been too pleased with. Uh, and I want to talk to you specifically today about a project which, which uh, we call the Primetime Torture Project, which looks at the way that torture is shown on television and the impact that that has on US soldiers in the field and also on the public debate in the United States in general. Um, I've made a short you know, 10 or 12 minute film, which, uh, which we'll show. But I, I wanted to tell you for a minute how I got involved in this. I was working on a project that was really trying to mobilize retired generals and admirals to be outspoken in their, um, in, in their really in, in their belief that torture was wrong and, and ineffective. And so I was calling during the day literally two, three hundred uh, over the course of a couple of months, generals and admirals, and talking to them about their feelings about the, this issue and trying to encourage them to take a public stand. And uh, it was weird, because I was kind of leading this sort of double life, because uh, at the same time, I, I started to become a fan of the TV show 24. Um, and I don't know, how many people have actually seen 24? Oh, great. So, so most people have. Um, and uh, the show, for those few of you who haven't, is quite dramatic and can be quite gripping. Um, and particularly, uh, how many people watched it on DVD? Yeah, so you guys know what I'm talking about when you say when you're done with one of the DVDs, you can't wait to actually watch the next one. And typically what, what happens in, in this show, it's supposed to be a day in the life of uh, this CTU agent who's kind of like an FBI agent named Jack Bauer, who's played by Kiefer Sutherland. And uh, over the course of the six seasons of the show, Jack Bauer and, and, and others have engaged in 89 incidents of torture. So, sorry. So almost every episode includes a scene of torture. Um, sorry. So weirdly, during the day, I would be talking to these admirals and generals about torture and uh, saying, that's oh, wrong, and so on and so forth. And then at night, I'd go home, and I'd root for Jack Bauer to rip the bad guy's heads off and use torture and, 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 and have it be effective which was very strange. And I started to sort of think about this show's impact on my life. And I started to actually talk to one of my colleagues, a woman who also uh, you know, worked on this same project who I knew was a fan of 24. And she said to me, um, yeah, I know, this, this is a great project and everything. But don't you kind of think that there is a time when, when we really do need a Jack Bauer, you know, in these sort of ticking time bomb scenarios? And I started thinking, this is just bizarre. If she and I are so influenced by this show, what broader impact does this have? And I started kind of nosing around. And I called, one of the first calls that I made was to a colonel at West Point who ran a law of war uh, semester long course that looked specifically at torture. And I could tell when I called him on the phone that the last person in the world that he wanted to talk to was another human rights guy. This guy was an expert in a case that was winding its way through to the Supreme Court. And um, he thought I was calling about that. And you know when you get on the phone with someone and they just desperately don't want to talk to you. And the conversation really pivoted when I said, no, 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 I'm not calling about the Hamdan case. I'm calling about 24. And he said to me, you're calling about 24? I can hardly believe it. 24 is one of the biggest problems I have in my classroom. This is great. And I thought, I guess this is great. And, and he said, I don't know why I said this. I'm standing up now. And for some reason, I stood up too. So. <laughs> We were having this very intense conversation. He says, where are you? And I said, I'm in New York. And he said, we got to get together. We've got 
we've got to do something about this. And uh, what ultimately came of that is we made a 12-minute film, which we are providing for free to military educators. We've, We've sent it to 1,200 military educators around the country. It's, it's being used at West Point and Army War College and Joint Military Intelligence College and, and so on. Um, so I, I think something useful has come of it. It's been interesting for me in, uh, in my learning about this. You know, this phone call showed me that there are students out there who are training to be a part of our armed services who are influenced by the show. Um, but I've subsequently learned, after doing a lot more research on this stuff, that in fact it's broader than just 18, 19, 20-year-olds who are going into the armed services. In fact, there's an, a, uh, a report that was done by the Army Inspector General, who's a three-star general, that found in, in his conversations with people in Iraq, uh, a lieutenant told him that in fact at the point of capture, this is a direct quote, at the point of capture, NCOs, non-commissioned officers, were using torture, well, we're using, I'm sorry, we're using interrogation techniques that they literally remembered from the movies and television. So that's in an Army Inspector General report. Um, and I subsequently have had a number of conversations anecdotally with Army um, people who've had experience in, in Iraq with the U.S. Army who, who tell me that, in fact, uh, they watch this stuff and then do the things that they've seen on the Iraqis in their custody. So anyway, I'd like to, if I can, show this 12-minute um, this, uh, video and we can talk a little bit more about it. And I'd be really interested to hear your thoughts on, on you know, this film and, and on this project. Let's see if I can actually get it to play. things that's distinguished this country's military has been a commitment to human rights and the rule of law. When you start to break from those rules and say there's an exceptional circumstance, the ticking time bomb, then up and down the chain you're going to find people violating those rules. It was constantly before us the, the, the notion that we needed to get information to save lives, the so-called ticking time bomb scenario. Tell me what you know about the Helix Protocol. Everything became a ticking time bomb scenario. It's too late. You can't stop this. And so even if you had a detainee who you had no reason to suspect of, of being part of an insurgency or even having knowledge of the insurgency, you could imagine that they have information that you want. Most of us who've interrogated for a career are hard pressed to ever think of a real situation that involved, you must get the information and if you don't succeed in getting the information in a matter of hours, uh, some catastrophic event is going to happen. There should be two wires coming out of there, one black, one yellow. One wire's blue, the other's white. Hold on, Sydney. There's a 50-50 chance Sydney cuts the right wire. I'm willing to take those odds. It's a serious problem in training Army interrogators. I find them constantly chafing at the notion that interrogation requires patience and subtlety and time because young Army interrogators are conditioned by their environment, and that includes political culture, to believe in this ticking time bomb scenario. White, tell her to cut the white wire. But those of us who've been there and who've really done this realize that it is just fiction. In reality, the, you know, interrogation is pretty boring. If you have a cooperative detainee, it's a lot of taking down notes and writing reports and getting a lot of boring information. It's not like it is on television where you get the information, you run out and save a bunch of lives. <laughs> I think interrogators, they wanted to see themselves as these rough, tough action heroes that you see on, on TV, the kind of interrogator like for Sutherland. Those men will kill your family if you don't tell me where the bomb is now. 
How would I characterize television and techniques? They're using techniques that, uh, that really don't work. But on television, they make you think that they work. I can't wait any longer. Tell me where the bomb is or I will kill us. If you're bombarded with thousands of hours of television where all you see is these extraordinary techniques, you're a young person, maybe you haven't received a lot of training, and you say, well, I've seen this, surely it must work. I've seen it 20 times on television. Tell me where the bomb is! When you're discussing what you should or shouldn't do, can or cannot do legally, uh, cadets would say, well, whatever it takes. If it's going to save American lives, whatever it takes. Uh, Jack Bauer shoots this guy in the leg and gets his information immediately. Tell me where the bomb is! The challenge is when you're dealing with a hardcore Al-Qaeda-typed terrorist trained to not allow you to elicit responses from him. And that's why the frustration level has occurred amongst interrogators, and that's why they felt they needed to resort to forceful techniques of pain to elicit information. Fine. General. On numerous occasions, there have been interrogations where hard, hard cell interrogation techniques were used against an individual, and that individual held out, held out, held out, and then at a certain point, which looked plausible, then started to spill his guts. You're running out of time. I will tell these men to kill your last son. Where is the bomb? That's it. Take him out. Now. What's the plan? But in spilling his guts, what he did was he identified his rivals and then used the United States to bring misery on his rivals and protect his tribe. I want you to know we didn't kill your son. We staged it. Basically, he played us. So you never know what you're going to get when you start by inflicting pain. Powerful, he's effective, he's saving America. Cadets are idealistic, they want to do the right thing, and they see a character like Bauer as someone who makes a difference, who's instrumental in saving the day. I would tell a soldier who is a fan of the show that Jack Bauer is a great fantasy hero, and that it would be nice if the real world worked that way, but the real world doesn't work that way. I was surprised perhaps even stunned to find out that actual um, interrogation methods that are taking place in the real world were being driven by what we created out of our, you know, fevered brains um, in an effort to create the most <coughs> immediate visceral entertainment. We came up with these crazy torture methods. We literally sit in a room and say, okay, what would be really scary if it were being done to you? What would be really effective in a 35 second, 45 second scene? I think you've never actually tortured anybody in your life. Unfortunately for us both, you're wrong. I think that TV shows and movies really misrepresent the way an interrogation works. It always seems that the interrogator on TV leans in on the subject, and then the, the subject clearly breaks, and this happens in less than five minutes. Perhaps losing an eye will loosen your tongue. Okay! And then once the subject is broken, he's broken, and he'll tell anything uh, that the interrogator wants him to. I mean, the few times that I've, I saw prisoners actually break in Iraq, that's, that wasn't the way it happened. It happened very slowly by building a, a relationship between the interrogator and the, the subject. Um, yeah, there's a lot of variables that I think are at work in the real world. But obviously in our fictional world, we do start out from certain premises which are fictional, which are wish fulfillments, which are basically fantasy. We are not you know, FBI agents. We're storytellers trying to 
come up with interesting and dramatic ways of, of telling tales. It is a, an inherently unreal premise. 20, that a story would begin and end in 24 hours and the events that occur in those 24 hours, you know, the, the, the premise is absurd. I would hope that people could understand that there's a real boundary and segregation between, um, you know, what a character can do in a, in a television show and what someone should do in real life. Lost is sort of a wish fulfillment program in that it's like it's about having a chance to do things over and these characters are desperately in need of a do-over, but in real life you don't get a do-over. So you have to really think long and hard about the consequences of your behavior in the real world. It's funny because in talking to you guys, um, I think we've been put in more of a thorny position because now we're questioning what we do. And often, frankly, we will side on um, what's the best entertainment, but we now recognize the consequences of it. And I think that we, um, as storytellers, are making an effort to be responsible and to present it in a responsible manner. Um, but it's also making us more aware of just how often we can fail. It would be nice if torture worked. I mean, if it were that simple. Let's face it, it really would be. As great as it would be to be Jack Bauer, uh, or as effective as Jack Bauer seems on television, he is on television. And uh, I think Jack Bauer is not, a, uh, is not a handbook. Do not, do not, do not use as your guide anything other than the training you've received since you've come in the service. In the real world, um, those things work on occasion, but you pay an enormous price every time you do it. Because every time you do it, you're pulling a little bit off of who you are as a country. You're pulling a thread out of the, out of the flag. You're, you're eroding the constitutional protections that you hope to have for your own people in this country. There's a film clip I use in the torture class from The Siege where the army general has an individual who is a member of a, a radical Muslim cell that knows where a bomb is. And they are about to torture him. And Denzel Washington says in very impassioned tones, you can't do this. Are you people insane? What are you talking about? The time has come for one man to suffer in order to save hundreds of lives. One man? What about two? Huh? What about six? How about public executions, huh? Feel free to leave whenever you like, Agent Hubbard. Come on, General, you lost, man. I've lost, man, but you, 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 you can't do this. Because if we torture him, General, we do that and everything that we have bled and fought and died for is over. And they've won. So what's the solution? The solution is training and the solution is leadership. Leadership that's present, that's vigilant, <laughs> that is identifying who needs to be taken off the front, who doesn't need to go on the patrol that day, who's starting to enjoy their job a little bit too much. Without the leader in the loop, you get anarchy. That's what separates us from the dogs. said that everything has changed because we were fighting the Nazis or the kamikaze uh, pilots of the Japanese. The United States stands for something and it stands for notions of human rights and respect for individuals. Even when you're uh, interrogating the worst of the worst, you have to live by those principles. It came from George Washington and it's been the history of this country over 200 years. 
stuff and at the end he says uh, if you're a leader you have to uh, look out for someone who's just enjoying their job maybe a little too much and you know Ken Robinson who's a former major in the special forces can deliver that line in a way I'm afraid I can't <laughs> um, so uh, we had in, in putting this project together we basically had two targets um, the first was to provide something that military educators could use, but the second was, and we thought maybe even a hopeless one, but to try and influence the way that Hollywood producers were doing their jobs. And so uh, we put together a group of people to go and meet with the executive producers of 24 and the writing staff of 24 and Kiefer Sutherland, who plays the main character. Uh, and we also met with the... Um, executive producers of Lost. Uh, and so we went out there about a year ago, um, bringing three um, interrogators, including Tony Lagaranis, who's in the film, uh, and Brigadier General Patrick Finnegan, who uh, is the dean and basically runs the military academy at West Point. Uh, and we had a fascinating set of conversations with um, people at 24, including Howard Gordon, who's in the film. They were very engaged, very interested in, in learning more about this. And, you know, we were sort of surprised that they said that they had never actually met with an interrogator before. You know, the show had been up for six seasons, and they, this was the first time they'd really actually sat down with an interrogator to talk about this stuff. Um, it was funny, though, one of the first things that happened was, in many ways, all that really needed to happen for me to kind of get the mindset. And that is that uh, I went with General Finnegan to meet Kiefer Sutherland, and we went to the set. Uh, we were supposed to meet him, I can't remember, 9.30 in the morning. And um, General Finnegan was there in his, you know, he looked very sharp in his uh, Class A field greens with the medals and everything and the haircut. And um, we were sort of standing there, and Kiefer Sutherland, 9.30, comes up and walks right past us. Uh, and we thought, you know, maybe he just thought it was someone else he's supposed to meet, who knows. And uh, this guy then comes up who's in a, you know, full LAPD SWAT uniform. And he kind of comes up to us and actually goes up on the kind of General Finnegan side and comes right up to General Finnegan and hits him in the shoulder pretty hard, which seems like a really weird thing to do, just particularly, I mean, it's weird to do that to anyone, but particularly weird to do it to a general. And, uh, and he said to him, hey, man, when's first call? And as it turns out, he thought the general was an extra on the show. Um, which was kind of interesting because the general was a real general. And, uh, but when you put him in the context of the show, they do, they fake real so well that even real seems, you know, you can't tell the difference. And I thought that was interesting because in the context of our conversations, they would say to us, as, as Howard says in, in the film, uh, you know, come on, it's wish fulfillment, this is just entertainment, this stuff is all fake. But the reality is that they are doing it in a way that is, is quite confusing, even to people on their own set. Um, they go to extraordinary lengths to try and make the, the um, show seem authentic, which is part of why I'm a fan of the show. I, I kind of like all that stuff. And it was pretty neat to walk around um, at the you know, CTU. They, for example, print out, they, you know, occasionally there's sort of piles of paper on people's desks. Those are papers that they've printed out off the DOD website in case as the camera is panning past it, it happens to pick it up so that it'll seem authentic. Um, and so it was kind of interesting to have had this experience and, and then have them say to us, come on, it, it's fake. How could anybody possibly think that this stuff is real? Um, I've got a little uh, quote here that I was going to read from... Um, you know, the, the Heritage Foundation had a symposium called 24 in America's Image in Fighting Terrorism. Fact, fiction, or does it matter? 
And uh, it was interesting because there were a lot of uh, actors who participated in the show, who participated in, in this forum. Um, and in, in addition to the actors, they also had um, Homeland uh, Security Secretary Michael Chertoff, uh, who participated in the discussion and praised the show's depiction of the war on terrorism as trying to make the best choice with a series of bad options. He went on, frankly, it reflects real life. And it's interesting because um, this woman, uh, Chloe, who plays Chloe on the show, is actually a stand-up comic. That's how they found her. Um, and she has a kind of quirky, unusual character on, on the show. You know, she plays this computer analyst. Um, and she says, as now, as a part, I went to see her stand-up a couple of months ago, but she says, and the biggest laugh line that she gets in her stand-up is that she participated in this symposium, and that afterwards she went and sat in between Dick Cheney and Clarence Thomas, and they turned to her, a stand-up comic who has this bit part on, on 24, and said, what do you think about our national security strategy? And they were asking her various questions about, you know, whether she could critique their, uh, their uh, way forward. Um, so, uh, as I say, we had these interesting conversations with um, the, the writers and the producers. Our sort of pitch to them was to say, look, you guys, you've, you've shown six seasons of this stuff. As a fan of the show, I know exactly what's going to happen when torture comes on. You guys have done 89 instances of torture, and it's always the same. Jack Bauer leans in on the guy, and bim, bam, bang, he gives up information, and it always happens to be the right information, and isn't it great, and the world is saved. And our view, or, you know, what we said to them was, that has all of these negative repercussions in the world, but also it's quite boring as a fan of the show. You have a real opportunity here to do torture in a way that's more realistic, that's more lifelike, and in fact, that way the lessons that, that 17, 18, 19 year olds who are watching the show take away from it would be a lot better. You know, for example, we said to them, what if Jack Bauer was torturing a guy and the guy died? We've never seen that, but in fact that happens a lot in the real world. Or what if he gave up false information? So it was interesting, it was back and forth and, and, um, and you know, we, we basically left there at kind of a standstill. But a New Yorker reporter kind of picked up on the fact of this um, of this meeting and wrote a big story in, in the New Yorker, which then was kind of circulated in, in, in Hollywood, I suppose. And um, a number of shows have risen to this challenge that these interrogators and that we kind of put on the table for 24. And in fact, The Shield last season had it, which is a uh, FX show, had a, um, an episode that was built around the idea that their lead character would torture the wrong guy to death. And then what would happen as a result of that? Law and Order Criminal Intent has done something along these lines. Criminal Minds did something along these lines. A lot of people have picked it up. Meanwhile, the 24 folks have gone back kind of to the drawing board. And there was a Wall Street Journal front page article a couple of weeks ago that kind of blew me away. Because as it turns out, they all, at the end of the season, went away and said, man, those guys from Human Rights First and the interrogators, maybe they're right. What can we do? And they thought about sending Jack Bauer to Africa and have him kind of make amends for all of the torture. And then, oh, we'd have, what would we do then? He'd have to fly back from Africa and 14 hours of our 24-hour show would be him on the plane. Um, so they threw that out. And uh, after, apparently, according to this article, really wrestling with it, they've come up with a new strategy for the next season, which is essentially to say to those of us who are pushing them to think more expansively about the way in which they show torture, is say to us, you know, screw you guys. And the next season, according to this kind of one minute trailer, looks like basically what's going to happen is it's, it's all about saying that Jack Bauer's been right all along for torturing these folks. And that uh, what happens in the beginning is he's, you know, as much as you can tell from the trailer, he's, he goes in front of the Senate investigative committee and they say to him, you, why, you know, why'd you do this? And he says, oh, it was the right thing to do. And as you follow the, the story arc, it looks like at the end, those same people who were investigating him and standing up and saying torture's wrong, then stand behind him and say, Jack, you've got to save us. You've got to use torture. And the last bit of the one minute is him saying, I'm going to enjoy this. So it sounds like the next season is a, you know, it's, it, it's crazy. It's like they're taking on their critics. And there's a part of me that really enjoys this stuff because it's, funny and fun and it's TV and exciting, but there's also a part of me that's just uh, sort of upset and, and uh, concerned about it. I mean, at its peak, 
20 million people watch this show. It's exported around the world to dozens of nations. It's the way in which a lot of people understand who we are, what our, what our security services do. And so the fact that the, that's the end result of, of this conversation, I think, is, is difficult. Um, anyway, I, I will uh, pause, and I'm interested in, in your questions and, and also really your ideas, because we're, I think, going forward in this. And, and I, you know, we may uh, do another film, or we, we'd like to, to take this to another step. So to the extent that you all have questions or thoughts, I'm, I'm interested. It looks like there's a, a system even. <laughs> oh, yeah, we're, we're, we're good at this. <laughs> OK. Um, thank you very much for, for the work you do and for bringing it here today. I have to say that a couple of months ago, um, Justice Scalia was at a Canadian conference on this subject. And he just said, look, Jack Bauer saves hundreds of thousands of people with these techniques. No one's going to arrest Jack Bauer. And I was. <laughs> Deeply, deeply embarrassed for our country that <laughs> right. a justice of the Supreme Court would, would use that as an explanation yeah. for torture. Right. Um, my question is this. I grew up on uh, James Bond, Dirty Harry, uh, Batman who dangles people over the side of buildings to get them to talk. Um, I feel that there's something different going on but I'm not really able to articulate exactly what it is. What is different about the media environment today? Um, or, or is it just that it reaches more people or whatever? I don't yeah, know. Yeah. Um, well, first, I can't resist but say something about the Scalia thing. The, the, weirdly, Scalia is exactly as you say. And weirdly, Scalia, in this panel in Canada, acted like Jack Bauer was a real person. Uh, saying, you know, Jack Bauer has actually saved hundreds of thousands of people in LA. If it weren't for him, bomb would have exploded, and, and, and people were kind of looking at each other like, he knows it's on TV, right? But he stayed in character for the entire time. Bizarre. There is, um, you know, pro probably somebody could find it. There's a great kind of send up of this, um, which is a cartoon that Dahlia Lithwick put together, I think, for Salon. It's a kind of three-minute cartoon where it imagines what would happen if Scalia actually joined the CTU and went along with Jack Bauer. Anyway, you might want to check it out. I think the answer to your question, and the reason that this is even an issue, is that the administration has changed the rules. It used to be that things were extremely clear about what was on and, and you know, what, what you could do and what you couldn't do. When, when that got taken off the table and then interrogators were, were pushed in, in direction to not only come up with information but to be creative in using their techniques, they turn to this kind of stuff. And so we're still in that, in that mode, unfortunately. And that's why I think it's an issue. And that was part of our pitch to 24, is to say, look, we know you're not the root cause of the problem. But right now, this is the situation we find ourselves in. And if you continue acting in the way you do, we're going to continue having you know, these sorts of problems. So, yeah. um, I guess I, I'm wondering about desensitization. Um, it, first of all, it's surprising to me that, that Current army recruits are influenced by 24. It's just sort of an age thing. I, I keep thinking of it. It's like a well, it's a, a new show. How can <laughs> how can our armed forces have any you know knowledge of this show? But it just seems like like it's not just that 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 you know a generation of kids growing up in video games are used to do-overs and you know dying and getting more lives and so on. And it's just sort of the, the, unre the, the unreality of life and death. Yeah. You just don't get that. Right. Well, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's clearly a part of what's happening. It's hard because on the one hand, we're concerned about what 24 does. On the other hand, it's a human rights organization that stands up for free speech. And so we're a little bit, you know, trying to walk that line. I think those are perfectly reasonable concerns. Those aren't really the concerns that we're pushing, um, even though, you know, as, speaking personally for myself, I can completely understand them. You know, we're just trying to have, that's my kind of point to, to, to 24 people. We're not saying you can't show torture. We're just saying that, guys, if you're a little more creative, you could really help undo some of these problems. So it's a, it's a fine line and difficult, and I think you raise a completely worthy point. Uh, hi. Um, it would be all right if I asked two questions. Sure. Um, the first one is, um, I noticed that it's um, conspicuously absent from your documentary 
and maybe that was deliberate, was a connection between um, you know, torture in the United States and its obligations under international humanitarian law. Uh -huh. And I was wondering if, um, if that was left out deliberately and um, if, you know, if you, you could explain like, what our connection is and why these pieces of papers like the Geneva Convention are, uh, are perhaps binding to us even if people think that they're quaint. Do you want to ask your second one now, or you want to wait for the answer to that one? Uh, oh, um, my <laughs> second, I guess, all right. My second question is um, about, about the information that you're showing, the data. Uh, I'm just wondering about how, what, what kind of um, process you use for, for counting the, uh, human, uh, the, the torture on right. television, and if you could explain why torture dropped, the depiction of torture dropped off after 2003. Right, great. Um, as to your first question, I, I, we in, certainly intended to convey that, that you know, it's obviously a violation of, of international human rights to use torture. And I, I think that's a small bit of this. For us, it, you know, again, our audience was soldiers. And so we really wanted to hammer home the field manual, which for them is kind of the Bible of how to do this stuff. Um, but there wasn't really an intention to, to leave out Geneva Conventions. Um, as for our, our methodology, uh, we had a, a bunch of interns watch a lot of TV. Um, and I'm the first to admit that it, it, it wasn't, it's certainly not foolproof. And there, it's also hard sometimes to count. You know, if you see somebody on, you know, law and order smack someone, is that a fight? Is that a torture? You know, um, but w what's overwhelmingly obvious to us in watching it is there was almost none of this stuff in the 90s and there's just a ton of it after 2001. As for why it goes up and then down, I think we're reaching a kind of new normal where there was none, then there was a just everyone did it. You know, even the craziest example to me is Star Trek. There was a new um, version of Star Trek called Star Trek Enterprise, I think. And the captain is just like Captain Kirk from the original Star Trek. You know, he's smart and he's good looking and he always wins and he's always right. There's only one difference between him and the old Captain Kirk and that is that he uses torture. So everybody is using torture. Star Trek, blah, 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 blah. Um, and so now I think we're, we're seeing, we're doing some more research with some more interns watching TV um, to see, but we're, I think we're in a kind of 100 to 150 scenes per year um, plateau. And, I think events will drive whether or not that falls off or goes up again. So, yeah. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, the first one is, supposing torture was illegal, as it should be, could somebody not in their defense use something like, if there really was a ticking time bomb, is that a valid defense from a criminal um, point of view? So there's no actual need to legalize it. That's one question. And the second question is, other countries have behaved differently, like Canada disbanded the Airborne Regiment after the torture thing in Somalia. I believe Israel has gone to the Supreme Court and has declared it's illegal and so forth. What's different about this country that, from these other countries? Right. Um, well, re with respect to your first question, um, the ticking time bomb scenario is something that we are always, you know, coming up against. And, uh, you know, it's hard because uh, the typical human rights response is to say that's ridiculous, it never happens, you never have the one guy, you never know that the one guy is the one who's planted the bomb that's going to blow up and it's going to kill 100 million school children. You just, that's never going to happen. You're never going to be in a scenario like that. That's the typical human rights response. But I've done a lot of work with interrogators who say, you know what, people say that the ticking time bomb is bogus, but it's not bogus. It's my life every day working in Iraq. And it's true they are frequently in situations where they think that they have someone who may have information that if they can get it out of them would save the lives of the people in their unit, platoon, whatever. And that may not be as dramatic as what you see on 24, but that's a real ticking time bomb scenario. And I think that's worth bearing in mind as we grapple with this because a lot of politicians who I think don't really know that much about this say torture should be off limits and then in certain scenarios we should probably recognize that someone like Jack Bauer ought to have the latitude to use these kinds of techniques and I think that's incredibly dangerous because there's so many people who think they're in that scenario in Iraq and in Afghanistan. The last reason why it's dangerous I think is that in fact torture doesn't work. 
I mean, you talk to these interrogators and they say, it's ridiculous. You mean to tell me that someone's going to go to all this trouble to kill 100 million people, and then you've got him, and you, you know, break his finger, and he's going to say, oh, that's it. I can't take it anymore. In fact, here's the real news. You know, he's going to run the clock for three or four more hours until he's accomplished his objectives. In fact, he may be so committed that he'd be willing to let you kill him. It's much better to use a, a very sophisticated technique, um, and we can talk about those if you guys are interested, in, in order to crack these die-hard types. Real world-class interrogators say that's how you get information out of them, not by, you know, jabbing them in the, in the knee with a knife like Jack Bauer does. So. Um, as somebody who watched 24 a lot and who kind of understands that it got into that cartoonish portrayal of violence almost, um, I noticed the same thing you did, which is that almost in every case, when Jack tortures somebody, it works, and it works very quickly. Um, I was actually just wondering what you thought about the fact that it's possible that maybe they recognize, they being the writers of the show, recognize that like that's kind of their bread and butter, that viewers want to see Jack torture somebody in a very simplistic way and to win. Um, and like how, if they said anything about how much responsibility they have to, to appeal to what's kind of obviously like their go-to motif right. versus an irresponsible approach to like actual military torture. Yeah. Um, my sense from them is that uh, they don't really know what makes the show so incredibly popular. They'd like to know because in fact their viewership has gone from 20 million and it's dropping down to 11. And uh, it, they don't know whether more torture, less torture, clearly they want people to tune in. But they, they're trying to figure that out. That's very clear to me in my conversations with them. And I, I, my guess is that in, in, internally, they are fighting that out. Is, it, is that really who Jack Bauer is? And is that why people tune in? Um, I can only speak as a fan of the show. I find it just boring. Um, and so my guess is that, that that's the case more broadly. But it, it may be that, mo more peop that there aren't a lot of people who are like me out in the world. <laughs> Maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> I'd like to comment that I think that there are two issues here. The bad news is that good news don't sell, only bad news. So probably the entertainment industry will go on doing some things that are outrageously cruel to attract audience. In fact, I just had it last week with something much more milder. I remember from my childhood that I liked Ch Tom and Jerry. Uh -huh. I, I came from an underdeveloped country, Israel, so I happened <laughs> to see Tom and Jerry just at the age of eight or something like that, and I remember it very nice. And I have two two-year-old child, and I wanted him to see Tom and Jerry. And after 15 seconds, I switched channel because it was so violent. <laughs> I mean, at age of eight, I could see the comic in it. But at age of two, he will go and right. beat his uh, classmates. Yeah. And uh, this, is, this is one thing. Uh, so the real thing is to make uh, the real people, the interrogators, sometimes young people, do not believe what they saw right. on television and, uh, and on, uh, on the screen in general. Just one comment. I hope you do not convince the uh, TV people to show how real interrogation goes because the terrorist will learn from it. Mm. So uh, yeah. let it be this way. <laughs> right. I mean, I, I know that usually uh, the torture really don't, don't work. Yeah. Uh, just yeah. leave it uh, behind. Right. Um, just two quick comments. One of the, I could hardly believe we were engaged in this conversation, but after the interns were watching all of this, we kind of come together weekly, and there was actually a debate. Well, Itchy beats up, or maybe Scratchy beats up Itchy on The Simpsons. Do we count that as torture? And I, to me, it was like, come on, that's ridiculous. There's no way that some interrogator, but we had to fight that out. Ultimately, we didn't include it. Um, but your comment made me think of that. Um, and as far as the, the last thing, I know a lot of people say that, but there are, there are as many ruses and techniques related to interrogation as there are movies and TV shows. You know, there's as much as you can possibly think of. Um, and so I think you're right. If we were out there saying, here's the hundred top techniques that people should use, that's no good. 
But saying the top two or three may be really helpful because I think people are really scared. And if they knew that interrogators, world-class interrogators, could crack die-hard Al-Qaeda types by using techniques other than torture, I think this debate would be off the table as it should be. So. Uh, just uh, two comments. First of all, I think it is a good thing uh, to show that some innocent person dies after torture. I mean, th this is a good thing that can attract also, also audience. Also, I, I was one of the few that didn't raise their hands whether I saw Lost in 24 <laughs> hours. And the reason was that I looked not at the first uh, show, but sometime I looked and after half of the uh, chapter, I decided that I was being manipulated and stopped looking at ah. it. Nice. So have you done statistics in terms of who is being tortured, especially by race? Um, I know that there was a statistic floating around that some percentage of people in Iraq felt they were there to take revenge for what happened to us on 9-11. And I'm wondering how much of the torture statistic is versus Arabs or people who look like Arabs. Mm -hmm. um, I wish that you had made that comment when we started this. Uh, we realized, you know, it's, and it's it seems sort of simple, you just watch TV, but in fact having a methodology in place that allows people to record everything that they've seen in a way that you can get through it and make certain fundamental uh, bits of data available like that would be really useful. So the answer is no because we started looking at it too late. Um, I think we could all probably guess what this stuff looks like. One thing that we noticed that's kind of interesting is that not only is there a lot more torture on TV now, but the torturers themselves are different. It used to be before 9-11 that in the handful of scenes that you typically saw, the torturers were aliens or bad guys or the you know, North Vietnamese. And now the torturers typically, or not, not always, but much more often, are the good guys. They're Jack Bauer. And before it didn't work, and now when the good guys use it, it works. So it's not only that there's a lot more, it's that who the torturers actually are and what it is has and changed. And it doesn't work on Jack Bauer. That's a funny point, yeah. In fact, Jack Bauer, when he's tortured, never gives up information. In fact, he was killed during one, se during one episode. Then he miraculously comes back to life, and everybody pats him on the back. Great job not giving up any information, and we all go on. So it never works for the bad guys. It always works for the good guys. So can you talk about some of the uh, two or three techniques that don't involve torture that work for interrogation? Sure. Um, you know, a part of this is, is dealing with these interrogators, and they all have amazing stories. Um, one of them that, that, that we told to uh, um, 24 folks is that, um, you know, one example is that they've got a guy and uh, they know that the guy has information that's actionable and there's, something's going to blow up or whatever in 48 hours. So they put him in a room where they can manipulate the sunlight coming in and they allow him to uh, pray. And they then manipulate the time and tell him, oh, it must be time for your evening prayers now. We'll, we'll leave you alone. And they're talking to him the whole time. They manipulate the time so that after, I don't know, 40 hours have passed, he thinks that 48 have passed. And they then go into him at the end of, this 48, uh, end of 40 hours, which he thinks is 48, and say to him, um, oh, how could you have done this? You say that you're a good Muslim. You've killed innocent people. And they kind of play on his narcissism. You know, you've fooled us. How did you do it? And he doesn't say, oh, you know, well, actually what I did was I planted the bomb in such and such a place. But he says, you know, maybe next time when you think about doing this sort of a thing, and in doing that gives them a clue about what he's planning on blowing up. That's an example of a kind of ruse where they get him talking, and he's talking in a way that he wants to puff himself up and uh, show that he's better than, than his captors, and therefore gives good evidence. Um, that's a kind of an example that they use. It was interesting, actually, one that we talked about with, with 24 was a kind of Mission Impossible example where uh, a bad guy's in, in jail and he gets broken out by what appear to be comrades and they spirit him away and say, you know, we're set up over here and here's what we're doing. What are you guys doing? And then he says all that he's doing. And in fact, those, those people were, were always in cahoots with, uh, um, with the good guys. And in fact, 24 put that into the 17th hour of, uh, of the sixth season. So um, it was kind of funny. I mean, I forget who was asking about torture and whether they just feel like this is their thing. I think they're kind of, you know, they're under tremendous pressure to get this stuff out. They've been doing it for six seasons. They're just casting around for something to do. So, yeah. 
That first one I've seen in a movie. I can't remember the movie, but I have seen it. So, uh -huh. <laughs> so it must be true. <laughs> As a follow-up to that, did, you have, did the interrogators you talked to, or did anyone, was there any realistic representation of what they do in any sort of film or movie or television anywhere? Uh, they, they, I mean, you know, there are certain constraints, obviously, and so uh, as Tony Lagarena says, a lot of it is just kind of boring, just kind of talking and getting information. But um, they say that, in fact, there is a lot of, of, of good stuff. And, and we actually, in addition to saying, hey, you guys are doing it wrong, <coughs> give out an award now, which we started last year, and we've given it to a show called Criminal Minds because we liked the way that they showed it. Um, and, and, you know, The Shield, it was very hard to watch. But in fact, what they showed was a guy who was a policeman who was certain that he had the bad guy, and he just beat him and beat him to death. Very difficult to watch. But in fact, very accurate. Um, and we had interrogators sit on this panel to give out this award, and they said, you know, like, there's no way that they would have this safe house like that. There's no way that he'd go in with a gun first, that kind of thing. But, I mean, by and large... Right. Uh, which did, you know, some large percentage of their show was in the box, in the interrogation room. Uh -huh. You know, sitting there wearing the guy down, you know, getting him off on tangents, you know, doing the whole good cop, bad cop thing, whatever. And it seemed a very accurate um, right. depiction of what I imagined that to be like, including the fact that occasionally there'd be a guy who they just had to let go and, you know, you know they never found the... Uh, right. Yeah. Nice. Well, thank you for the DVD recommendation. <laughs> I'll check it out. Yeah. Thanks. Um, well, great. Thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it.